Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Would you like please move forward? It's it's um, it's a fantastic um, symposium that we've got for you today. So um, I'm, I have to start by saying we're very very sorry that Ruth Feldman wasn't able to join us today. So we're actually down to just the two talks, but that gives us a little bit more time for questions. Uh, my name's Vicky Salem. I'm from Imperial. Um, my name's Louise Hunter. I'm from Manchester. Um, and I think is there anything else we need to say? Beforehand? Ha yeah, housekeeping, you know, yes. no recording. Toilets are that way, fire exits that way. Um, so to, to kick us off in what we're hoping is we're going to be a really fascinating um, session that will give you some real food for thought is um, Mark Gunnell from Cambridge, whom many of you will, will know well. Um, what you might be less familiar with is his um, more recent, really exciting work, which he's just described as his fascinating voyage into uh, the endocrinology of financial trading. So looking at how uh, the cortisol and testosterone and the people who are making these key financial decisions that affect us all, um, whether that's the same as the rest of us. So uh, I'll invite him up to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise and Vicky. So um, it's... Uh, you've just indicated. This is um, a slight detour off into a different area which has proved intriguing um, over the last decade. And I must admit that when I was first contacted by um, a person who I'll uh, mention during the talk to engage in this, I thought this was pretty cranky and I kept trying to ignore him. Uh, and that he was very persistent and kept coming back. And I have to say, it really has been a, an interesting thing to do. Now, the session is actually something to do with love. And I was a bit struggling on this one. Um, but actually, I guess if you're a trader, you may well love money. Maybe that's your major obsession in life. And that's what really drives you on. And actually, I have to say that going on to trading floors and meeting these individuals has been an interesting experience. So we're going to talk about financial markets. We're going to talk about trading floors. Um, just out of interest, um, anybody in here ever been on a trading floor? I actually know that there are a couple of closet ex-traders amongst the world of endocrinologists. I'm just trying to work out, without mentioning their names, whether they're in the room. I think I'm probably safe at the moment. So there are a couple of eminent members of our society who have, in a previous life, been traders on a London trading floor. I don't know what your uh, impression or image of a trading floor is, but it's probably something like this. It's probably a whole bunch of slightly hyper males sort of stampeding on top of each other, jumping up and down, trying to get one over on top of each other. That's, of course, the old world. This is actually not the way it works on most markets at this point in time. Most markets actually now are run from um, institutions like this. All very civilized, everybody sitting down in a nice row, everybody actively engaged with their computer screens, engaged in different activities. Um, however, some things haven't changed very much, and that is that if you want to study traders, you still find yourself studying mainly males, interestingly, because it's mainly men who still sit on many of these trading floors. There are ladies involved in trading, but they are often operating separately, not in these sort of conglomerations together. And it's interesting looking at how people behave when they are together in this sort of environment. So a lot of the world's activities is now done from this sort of arrangement, and of course, in many ways, um, these are perhaps the largest and most intensive competitive forum that's ever been created in the world, and the stakes are absolutely huge. And we all know, sadly because of the economic crisis, that they are a huge determinant of global prosperity and have a massive impact for you and I, what goes on on the trading floor. And they are very, very variable. They're incredibly cyclical in nature. So if you go back over time, the financial markets have highs and lows, and they have extremes. Um, the so-called bull and bear markets, um, when things are either coming to a, an absolute head with ludicrous exchanges going on, or when the bubble completely bursts and then everything completely crashes. But one thing that's really clear about um, trading here is that you have to be an individual who's prepared to take risk. Nothing is given to you for nothing. So you have to be somebody who's prepared to make some calculated decisions that might result in a huge payoff, but that may also result in a huge loss. Now, of course, risk is part of everyday life for all of us. Whether you're on your way to work in central London and you prefer to take the slightly more um, conservative approach, or whether you just come out, jump on the bike and get going, we all make different conscious decisions. Sport, of course, is a place where huge amounts of risk are taken. And if you're prepared to um, play in the opposition, for example, to Vincent Company, the club captain for Manchester City, you have to be prepared to accept the consequences um, of this sport and the risk associated. But people tend to limit the amount of risk they take. 
Most people don't go jumping out of an aeroplane um, with only somebody else holding on to you to determine whether you get to the ground safely or not. And welcome to Kuretik Oshkovin, who's actually what's known as a new generation of urban explorers. I don't know if you've seen these people, but these are people who just walk along the girders on the tops of high-rise constructions with no form of any safety. There was a sad case of somebody who recently demised recently who decided to do a backflip on top of them and unfortunately missed a stepping, and you can imagine the consequence. So, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty conservative on my risk-taking compared to these people, but these are, quotes, allegedly normal individuals who are only fired up by having a different uh, take on life. And actually, the question is, do we see this, for example, on the trading floors? Do we see people who are selected for different reasons? So this is um, a typical trader sitting now in front of this huge bank of screens. My juniors take the mickey out of me because I've got two computer screens on my desk. So they think I've turned into some form of city trader. Um, I can tell you that I'm still doing the day job. No money made there yet. These guys are looking at this enormous bank of screens. And in fact, the best thing I can do is to compare them to a tennis player at the net. These guys are very often very physically fit individuals who really pride themselves in what they're doing. And they are absolutely sitting watching and listening to this enormous bank of information, trying to decide when to go, when to act, when to make a decision. And you can imagine, you have to be a pretty physically adept individual. Um, you certainly can't have a bitemporal field defect if you want to make the most out of actually all the information that's feeding in. And this is just the visual information. There is a constant stream of auditory information coming to them as well. And they are having to make the decisions there and then as to what they choose to do. And you and I depend on what these guys are doing because that's determining where the markets are going. So risk taking undoubtedly impacts on the market stability. And that of course affects the economic growth that we see. And that of course ultimately determines population, health and well-being. So, Interestingly, when you look back, there have been some pretty entrenched beliefs about risk-taking in the financial markets. It has been held, certainly from economics and behavioral um, psychology, that most of us make pretty consistent risk decisions over life. So the sort of person we are, either a risk-taker or less of a risk-taker, is fixed and it remains relatively stable. And also, there is a premise that somehow that risk-taking is very rational that we only make cold light decisions based on our intrinsic programming for risk preferences. So, we're either the person who wears the high vis jacket plus the um, cycle helmet, or alternatively, we're prepared to take our chance with the London buses and taxis. So we're programmed, as it were, and we'll always be the same sort of person. But the question is, is this correct or justified? And if you think about yourself, do you believe that you are pretty consistent in the way you take risk and do things, or do you vary? Do you things, do, do thing, uh, things differently from time to time? So this is the guy who got me involved. This is John Coates. John Coates um, was formerly a Cambridge graduate who's a neuroscientist. Um, he worked out rapidly that you don't make any money in neuroscience, so he went off and became a trader. John ran uh, trading desks uh, on Wall Street for a decade. Um, I think he must have done okay, because I can't see that he's had a regular job since he came back several years ago. So I think he must be financially all right, but he never discloses that bit. But he's a guy who kept harassing me and saying, actually, can we have a look at this scientifically, please? Because I'm actually intrigued by the fact that when I was running the trading floors, I encountered some rather strange behavior amongst the, the people who were working with me. So. A lot of them, for example, were very happy to take really major risk, risky decisions and choices that I wasn't really happy to sanction um, when the market was rising. But equally, as the market started to fall, when I thought they should be trading, they were stopping trading. And this didn't seem right to me. And there was a small amount of data starting to come out that did suggest that perhaps people's risk preferences in this setting were uh, actually able to fluctuate and they were not fixed. So he wanted to ask the question, is physiology at play here, and is it changing the way in which the traders respond? Now, that wouldn't be surprising, because if you think about any situation where you're about to take a risk or make a key decision, not only cognitively are you activated by this process, but also physically you're activated in this process. And we all recognize the neural pathways, which are switched on at that time, for example, as the uh, adrenaline and cortisol levels start to rise that then help us to uh, make the decision that we're going to choose. 
Equally, none of us are immune to our surroundings. So what happens to these traders when the bottom falls out of their world? As has happened in the past on numerous occasions, and as we know only too well happened around the 2008 crash. Physiology is changing very, very quickly at this point in time, and is it changing the way in which these individuals are actually responding? And if it is, is it just a reaction, or does it actually dictate what they do? And that was the key question that John wanted to ask. So he had a hypothesis that the markets were moving between places where gains were being made or places where losses were being made, and this obviously works for an individual on a day-by-day. -day. And he wanted to know, is it possible that testosterone and cortisol are changing in response to financial return? And his hypothesis started with the fact that um, when you're making money, does your testosterone rise? And you'll see in a moment why he had that hypothesis from some um, animal studies. He also wanted to know, that is it the case that when you start to lose money, your cortisol level rises, as you'd expect in a stressful situation? As I say, this was based on a considerable amount of animal data and um, some human data, which for a long time has spoken about the concept of androgenic priming. So this is the issue whereby, if you're in a competition, so for example, if you take measurements of testosterone in eight people about to do a 100-metre sprint, and you then uh, measure that testosterone again at the end of that, you see quite dramatic changes in a very short space of time afterwards in testosterone in response to whether you win or lose. So there is a concept of whether, as, you are, um, as your testosterone levels start to rise, um, you start to adopt different behaviours. So in animal circles, we know that the dominant male often has the higher androgen levels. They tend to have more confidence. They tend to be more persistent in their searches. They have a preference for novelty, looking for new and different things. And there's also that euphorogenic effect of competition. We all know of the high-performing athletes or performers in any of the arts, et cetera, who talk about the buzz that they get when they're in the height of their performance. And this increases appetite for risk. And that's known as the winner effect. And as I say, in various circumstances, it's been documented that androgen levels, testosterone, rises significantly in the winner and drop off quite sharply in those who are less successful. The problem is, when does that segue into excessive risk when you start to lose? So we know, for example, if you're a dominant male in an animal uh, kingdom, eventually, if you get overconfident, you try to start patrolling an area which is much bigger than the one you can look after. You then get other males challenging you. Ultimately, you can't control the situation. Things can go into a downward spiral. So the question is, when does effective risk-taking that has kept you at the top suddenly become risky behavior that means that you actually start to lose, uh, and therefore everything comes to a crashing halt. So that applying this to the financial markets, John came up with a model that suggested that if we look at the amount of money that traders are making, which can be easily judged, profit and loss data, every firm records almost minute by minute the amount of money that's been made and lost by their individual traders. If we look at profit and loss, and you can only stay in the game if you tend to make money, there's no role for people who are losing money in these firms, as you start to make more money, is it possible that this is a feed positive cycle whereby you get on a bit of a winning streak, the winner effect kicks into play, and you start to see your testosterone levels rising. That then ultimately, if affecting enough individuals within the market starts to drive movement towards the bull market and ultimately towards the bubble, but actually at some point that bubble has to burst. And when the bubble bursts, you start losing money rapidly and at that point, do we actually see a negative impact and testosterone levels start to drop? So this is the first study that um, John conducted, and it was shortly at this, around this time when he got in contact with me, where he went on to one of the trading floors. Quite difficult to get access to the trading floors um, and to allow um, all this data to be uh, taken out. But actually, one trading floor were happy to go with this. And um, he took, in essence, 17 male traders, typical age, 18 to 40-ish, whose annual income ranged between 12,000 pounds and 5 million pounds. What was even more remarkable, and this is a thing that really made my eyes water when I went to watch this in action, is that the individual trades that these individuals conduct range between 100,000 pounds and 500. 
500 million. Now, 500 million is a lot of noughts, and you end up sitting there and counting them and saying, are you really about to place, a, uh, as it were, what's close to a qualified bet using that money? Because presumably some of that's my money as well as your money. Um, and that's what they do. And it's interesting how they become almost immune to it. Clearly they're aware of what they're doing, but actually it's almost not real money at this point. And what John was allowed to do at that stage was relatively modest. It was to take salivary levels for testosterone and cortisol um, at two time points in the day for eight consecutive trading days. And then they looked at how the hormone levels matched with profit and loss data from these individuals. Now, you need to understand that the way in which the markets work is often driven by what's happening in the US. So if you're sitting on a London trading floor, most of the activity is happening from lunchtime into mid-afternoon because that's when the market is warming up in Wall Street. So the first thing he observed was if you average the testosterone, and then if you particular focused on the testosterone at 11 a.m., which is the level taken before anybody knows what's about to happen on the London, sorry, on the U.S. markets on Wall Street, he found that the testosterone was higher in the morning, as I'll show you in a moment, on the days when the traders made more money than their average profit and loss, for example, for the previous month. So if we look at that, what that says is there's a 25% higher level in testosterone on the morning before you make a lot of money than there is in the afternoon. Now, you might immediately say, surely these guys have insight. They must know what's coming down the track. They know they're going to have a good day at the office. But actually, a lot of this data is very, very closely guarded. So they don't genuinely know. They know what's going to be released. They know what financial data is coming, but they don't know which way that's going to go because that data is often very, very tightly regulated. So this was the first hint that somehow the testosterone may actually be ahead of the profit-making rather than a reaction to the profit-making. Interestingly, for cortisol, he was predicting the opposite, but he couldn't see anything immediately at that stage linking with profit and loss in this small number of individuals. So the model now was that testosterone was driving gain and money-making, and that was in a cycle that went on but perhaps ultimately it could come to the point where you become too risky and you go over the edge and at that point you start to make losses. And I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time showing um, all the data relating to this because there have been a multitude of studies that have sprung out after this all published of varying qualities where people have tried to administer testosterone and see how it changes people's behaviour. A lot of it is actually difficult to interpret because the levels of testosterone that people have administered have been hugely pharmacological as opposed to physiological. But there is data that supports this model beyond John's work, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. What I do want to do is to talk more about the other side, because this is actually where we've spent more time looking, which is looking at cortisol. So everybody was very interested in this issue around testosterone. Can we manipulate testosterone in these traders and change their behavior? In fact, the most interesting thing I ever got asked to do, which I mentioned at the start, was after the original research was published, a trading floor manager contacted me and asked me whether I might be prepared to consider supervising the administration of estrogen to some of his traders. I pointed out that this would presumably truncate my career quite quickly. Uh, there was another option to solve this estrogen conundrum which he had, which was to employ people with an endogenously higher level of estrogen, um, presumably women, um, and that might solve the problem. Um, needless to say, I heard nothing very much more from this individual thereafter. Anyway, I thought that this meant this was far too risky an area to go into, so let's go to something boring like cortisol instead. But cortisol, of course, isn't boring, because cortisol, as we know, is also a major player, and we'll hear later on in one of the plenaries about its um, central roles in regulating both physiology and also psychology. And John had made some very interesting uh, observations, um, and this seemed uh, potentially a track to pursue, because, of course, we all know that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is particularly sensitive to novelty to uncertainty, to uncontrollability. When, that, when we find ourselves in those situations, we often find ourselves um, with activation of multiple systems, but including the HPA axis. And we also know that cortisol over time can alter our mood, our memory, and our behavioral responses to threatening circumstances. And again, there's a, a, a quite a substantial mountain of animal data to support that. And if you're interested in that, then I'd point you to Bruce McEwen's work, who's really been seminal in describing a lot of this. So we were interested as to whether cortisol rising in response to market volatility could change what the traders were doing. 
And so there are many indices um, of volatility within the markets, uncertainty if you like. Perhaps one of the best ones is the VIX, the volatility index, which has sometimes been known uh, by the traders as the fear gauge. And this essentially indicates that the more uncertainty within the market, the more volatility, the higher the score. And you can see that at the time of the crash, everything went off the top of the screen. And um, at points, for example, where landmark things happen in the financial world, such as in 2010 when the Dow fell by 1,000 points in a matter of minutes, the volatility index spikes very suddenly. So the volatility index is actually quite a reasonable readout of just how much uncertainty, anxiety there is within the marketplace. So going back to John's original study, he had noted that if you look at the mean cortisol level for each of the 17 traders and you plot it against the standard deviation of their profit and loss. Now, if you think about that, the standard deviation being greater means there's much more variance in their profit and loss. So they're bouncing up and down. So they're winning, they're losing much more up here when you're four SDs up than when you're down here at two. The first thing he noted was that actually there was a reasonable correlation between the average cortisol level throughout the study for an individual trader compared to how much volatility was in their own profit and loss. But this was a really stunning figure which really got my interest, which was John had plotted volatility, which you can do on a variety of scales. Um, this is something called implied volatility, showing the, ma the markets um, increasing in volatility over a key period as various releases from the US markets are described. So these are potentially significant events in the markets which will potentially distort, um, how, or sorry, change how much money people are about to make. And as these releases were coming along, you could see over the ensuing days, not only did the volatility of the markets go up, but the curve for the average cortisol level across the traders started to interestingly produce a mirror in, as of that, implying that these individuals were perhaps more anxious and uh, preparing themselves. And in fact, if you look at the average cortisol from an area under the curve calculation, it increased by about 68% over an eight-day eight period. Now, that's a magic number to bear in mind, 68% over an eight-day period, because... Um, as you'll see in a moment, John came back to me and asked whether we could reproduce precisely a 68% rise in cortisol over an eight-day period in some healthy volunteers. But before that, we went back to the markets and we found another trading floor. We thought we ought to try and reproduce whether this was true. And this is one of those fortunate moments in life where we eventually got agreement from a trading floor. And when we got back there, um, they actually um, allowed us on just as the Greek debt crisis struck and as the Greek um, economy went into freefall. And so um, we were on the floor again for a two-week period um, as it became unclear as to whether um, the Greek economy would be bailed out or not. And every day was a highly unpredictable day. And so another marker of volatility, um, stock and bond volatility via the Z index here, was bouncing up and down all over the place. And again, this is the average cortisol level for 15 traders on a similar sort of floor to the one we looked at previously, bouncing around at the same rate. So these guys are going up and down in response to the stimuli that they're receiving. Um, so this, uh, as I say, was quite fortunate that we arrived at that point in time when there was a lot of volatility around and a major event to, to link it to. And this therefore raised some important questions for us. The first was, does the increase in cortisol that we're seeing that's coming from that market uncertainty, actually has it got any consequences? Can it feed into changing the risk preferences of these traders or is it just a coincidental event with no consequence? Secondly, does it matter whether it's an acute rise in cortisol happening suddenly over half an hour or whether it's sustained because you're stressed for a week or two in a row? So if you like the difference between acute and chronic hypercortisolism. So we know that if you put people's cortisol level up acutely, they'll often feel more motivated, they'll have initial focus of attention, they may even feel um, euphorogenic. But we also know from our long-term knowledge of endocrine patients that if you've got sustained hypercortisolism for a long period of time, you can often have a selective attention to fairly negative precedents. Um, you notice anxiety perhaps when others aren't. And what is also interesting, and this is a really important point, is the tendency to find threat um, where it doesn't necessarily exist. So it's the anticipation that something awful is going to happen, even if it is not likely to happen or doesn't happen. And that's really quite important when you think about people who are sitting in front of trading screens trying to make a decision as to whether to take a position or not. 
So the idea here was that somehow cortisol was potentially contributing to the crash. So in order to do that, we went back from the field into the um, laboratory, if you like, and this time you can't really do a randomized double-blind placebo crossover controlled study on traders on a trading floor. I'm not sure I want to be in the headlines because I caused the next financial crash by adjusting cortisol levels or testosterone in real traders. So that was never going to happen. So we had to go and find some healthy volunteers. So we found a bright bunch of young people um, who needed um, some financial remuneration. So we had a reasonable representation of students in here. I'd just like to say none of my medical students, especially as five of them are sitting uh, at the back there. So we deliberately did not recruit medical students to this. Um, so we had 20 men and we also deliberately wanted as many ladies in here as we could, so we had 16 ladies as well. Similar age group to the average trader that we'd studied on those floors. And the study was a three-arm study. Um, you either had an active drug with hydrocortisone, followed by a washout and then placebo, or the other way around, all because of the tasks that I'm about to show you, um, we also had an arm which was double control, placebo, washout, placebo. I assume we are okay time-wise given that we don't have a second speaker. So these uh, were then given for an eight-day treatment period with a washout in between um, of seven days. We also tried to make a conscious decision not to do what many studies had done, which was to give massive pharmacological doses of hydrocortisone, but instead to try and raise the cortisol levels comparable to what had been seen in the traders. And this is where this nominal figure of John said to me, can you precisely raise the cortisol by 68% over eight days, please? Again, this is one of these entertaining moments of life, because if you take all the volunteers and you look at all the areas under the curve and combine them together, it came out at 69%, which I thought wasn't bad, actually. But he said that wasn't quite good enough. So there you go. That's a man who makes money. So what happened is, uh, on day zero and day seven, so the eighth day, as it were, of the study, um, they all undertook screening questionnaires, because we needed to make sure nothing else was going on in life that was going to potentially change their endocrinology. Um, they also donated saliva and venous samples. They had cardiac monitors um, added, and then they were dosed with hydrocortisone or placebo. They waited in a quiet room for 90 minutes, and then they had repeat samples, and then they went on to perform the computerized tasks that I'll show you. And then uh, for the time that they were away from us, we asked them to collect saliva samples um, dotted around the days on days two, four, and six in order to allow us to, if you like, to some degree check compliance, but also just to see what level of cortisol on average we were raising them by. Now here are the computerized tasks. So let's try it out with the audience as we have a moment or two. This is a lottery. You are faced with both of these options. Lottery A allows you a guaranteed return. You can't lose. You'll either get 30 pounds or you'll get 90 pounds. Lottery B gives you a much bigger chance of getting 90 pounds. You might also get 30 pounds, but there's a definite possibility of getting nothing. Okay, who's a Lottery A person? Okay, who's a Lottery B person? Okay, I'm not sure which group of pay people the GMC would like to know more about, but anyway. <laughs> so, that's what happened on the floor. We got a complete mix of people who were those who prepared to take more of a risk than the other risk. And again, as you can imagine, that is like spinning the roulette wheel. They had no idea what the chance of this was. They were not being given any waiting information to say this was more likely or that was more likely. They were simply told, you play the lottery. Now, in fact, what happened is they played many, many lottery pairs over and over again, and they were told that we would randomly select one of the lottery pairs they played, and that one would determine the additional cash payout that they would get on top of what they were already getting for participating. This was the worst project to put through ethics I have ever done. And I went through the psychology ethics committee, thank God, not NRES, and it was really challenging to persuade them that this was an ethical thing to do. But unless you can incentivize people, they won't do it properly. So you need to give it. And in fact, the biggest winners here were taking home 500 pounds, which for your average student is not a bad return. So they've got this choice between that roulette wheel or that roulette wheel. And they're playing over about a half a minute, uh, sorry, a half an hour period, multiple pairs of lotteries. And they're doing it twice, which is why you can get up to quite a large payout at the end of it. So the first thing to do is to see what happened to the cortisol levels uh, in response to the dosing. Well, as you might imagine, in the acute phase, 
um, the cortisol level rose um, steeply if you were in the active arm. And actually what was quite nice to see was our quiet room allowed the sort of diurnal dropping cortisol to occur. So we actually had quite a marked difference in acute and um, placebo arm cortisol levels 90 minutes later. And then if you look at the, um, and this is very much average cortisol data for all the volunteers in the study who were in the active and placebo arms, you can see that over the course of the study, the average cortisol level, and this is where the area of the curve calculation came in, the average cortisol level was sustainably higher in those on the active phase than those on placebo. It's interesting, on the day that they come back, there's clearly a degree of anticipation about what's going to happen when they come to perform, because you can see that level drifting back up again. And um, all of these measurements were undertaken in saliva, but on day zero and day seven, we also had paired blood samples. I won't show that data, but we got pretty much exactly the same result. I will briefly tell you that we saw no change in androgen or estrogen levels, uh, in fact, in any of the sex steroids that we measured in either the males or the females in this study, which was a relief because otherwise we'd have had another potential variable there. Now, this is where we just need to understand a tiny bit about the basic principles of economics bit underlying this. Um, this is what's called a utility curve. And in essence, what a utility curve tells us is how much value we place on a particular payoff um, for example, going from zero up to 100. Now, if we placed as much value, for example, on the first five pounds that we made as we did on the last five pounds that we made, going from five to 100 pounds, this would be a linear relationship. But the intriguing thing is that for everybody, we place more value on the first amount, the first bit of money we make, and less on the subsequent amounts. So the first five pounds that takes us from zero to five seems to mean more to us than the five that takes us from 95 to 100. And this is known as um, a utility function. And this is not data just derived here. This is well-validated data. This is a typical utility curve where it flattens out. So it's not a linear relationship. Here are the results in the study. So in placebo day one, typical utility curve. You might say, have these flattened out a little bit with acute cortisol or placebo day seven? For what it's worth, statistically, these were not significantly different. But what was dramatically different was the change in the distribution of the curve once these individuals were under chronic cortisol exposure. So they became more risk averse. And you can look at that in several ways. So for example, if I go to this lottery, where the chances are a 60 or a 90 pound payout, or a 90 or a 60 and a zero, you might think, that's a bit of a no-brainer. You go over here, that's a reasonable return. But at the start, 50% of people were choosing this lottery. So what happens after their chronic cortisol exposure? Well, the interesting thing is that under placebo, it's about half choosing each. Under acute cortisol, we see no difference. But by the time we've got them under this slight uh, ex excessive cortisol exposure, we've got nearly 80% of them now deviating towards choosing the safe lottery. So it seems that this cortisol exposure is changing your risk preference. And if we look at it in a couple of other ways, if you look at the expected return from this lottery, the return is obviously lower on that lower risk lottery, but more, patient, uh, more people are actually predicting or quite happy to settle for a lower expected return. And they are therefore getting lotteries which have got a lot less variance attached to them. Variance is the amount of dispersion of the options available to you. So everything is pointing in the same direction. The more cortisol you see, the less likely you go to go for the higher gamble, the more you play the safe game. And then we also looked at how much individuals weighted the information that they received in terms of what's known as a probability weighting function. So these have now been split into males and females. And in essence, what this does is that if we feed you a small amount of information, you need to make a decision. What we tend to do is we tend to slightly overweight little bits of information, which really aren't going to make that much difference to the decision in the end, or often overweight information um, that actually might make it, sorry, the other way around. We overweight little bits of information or underweight um, pieces of information which are actually going to make more of a difference. And what's interesting under chronic cortisol is that whereas the females um, remain pretty true to the line of unity, no significant difference, the males started significantly overweight, overweighting the value of this small amount of information and underweighting the additional. So there seems to be a difference in sexes here and so how they use bits of information to make a decision. So in essence, when we see a financial crisis arising, our belief now is that cortisol is a rather unwelcome visitor during a crisis. 
because it occurs necessarily because of the processes that you're experiencing physiologically, but it's no longer a bystander. It's actually then feeding into the process and changing what happens. And so we see extended periods of volatility raising cortisol levels, sustained increases in cortisol leading to risk aversion, and then traders becoming risk averse just when the markets need them most. For the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to show you something slightly different, if that's okay. So while we were here looking at cortisol, we also decided to look at something else which John felt was relevant, which was gut instincts. Are these true or are they mythical? When you say you have a gut instinct about something, is it a real or is it not? Well, there's a whole world of science behind gut instincts. And things such as just your ability to sense your resting heart rate when you're sitting there in a moment of anxiety versus not differ enormously between individuals. And these, this is the whole science of interoception. And it's actually believed that these may also guide our behaviors. And so um, there is, again, a body of evidence that says that individuals vary in their ability to sense their gut instincts. And the way we looked at this just very briefly was to actually look at the ability of the traders on the trading floor to tell us what their resting heart rate was. They're not allowed to put a finger on a pulse. They just have to sit there and tell us what they think their resting heart rate is. And they also have to tell us when they're fed an auditory tone that's going, is it in tune with your heart rate or is it out? I don't know about you, I'm absolutely hopeless at this. And actually, as I'll show you in a minute, that means I clearly must not go into the financial markets because I really don't know what my resting heart rate is. But if we compare a group of medical students from another medical school, not mine, who were the controls here, and look at their ability on average to be accurate in their prediction of their resting heart rate versus traders, the traders are significantly more able to predict what their resting heart rate is. And interestingly, if you look at the amount of money that they make, there seems to be at least a loose correlation between the amount of money you make and your ability to be aware of what your resting heart rate is. And even more interestingly, if you look at the survival of traders on the trading floor over time, so these are years of which people have been trading and making money, over time, you find that those who are senior traders were 85% of the time accurate in predicting their heart rate compared to the junior traders who were no different to the controls. Now, you might argue, does that mean they've acquired something during this process? We don't know. The alternative argument is that the process selects for those who can and those who can't. And what's interesting about it is these individuals are more aware of their interception and it raises the interesting prospect of the question of whether if you're aware of your emotions and what's going on, do you control them better and therefore you don't allow them to influence your decision making. So to finish and to conclude, um, what we believe is that the findings from the field and the laboratory point to an alternative model for risk taking in the financial markets in which endocrinology is very true and real. And risk preferences aren't stable, they're dynamic, they can change. And the appetite for risk um, expands as the market gets bigger and it contracts as the market gets smaller. That means that crucially, if cortisol is rising as the markets become more uncertain and volatile, then perhaps just at the point when we need these people to take more risk, because that's what you need when the market starts to fall. You need people to take positions and start to try to generate activity. And if they're not doing that, perhaps they're just accentuating the downward spiral. And it may be that physiological driven changes in risk preferences are actually quite a significant contributor to market instability. Um, and these have been overlooked in all the traditional models. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I'll be very happy to um, answer any questions. I sh should acknowledge those who've done a lot of the work with me. Mark, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating and a bit scary as well. Um, it actually reminded me of why I fell in love with endocrinology in the first place, because it's just fundamental to our humanity, yeah. isn't it? It's a really amazing talk. Thank you. Questions? Kate. I thought that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. With your group of ladies that were part of the lottery trial, did you pay any attention to what stage of their menstrual cycle they were at and whether there were any gender differences? Yeah, very good question. So first thing to say is we um, uh, had to exclude anybody who was on um, combined oral contraceptive prep, in fact, on any contraceptive preparation because uh, we, want, we could have taken those in, but we wanted to see what was happening endogenously rather than with fixed. We thought about that, but we elected not to do so. 
Um, and then we actually studied them um, so they were exactly at the same phase of cycle um, related as best we could do to their menstrual diary that they had before them. But of course, there was a bit of variation as you might expect in that. The only thing we uh, mandated was a minimum seven day washout, but obviously we had slightly longer uh, for those ladies in order to try and keep them as close as we could. When we looked at the cohort as a whole, looking at average, um, for example, estradiol levels for what that's worth, and also looking at the gonadotrophins, there was no difference between them. So we tried to control for that. I'm not sure we were perfect in it. Michael Tunbridge, Oxford. I enjoyed your talk very much. It took me a long time in my career to realize that for most people, the statistical risk is not what they're worried about, it's their perceptions yeah. of the risk that are more important than the statistical risk. This is true for complications of surgery or infection after an yeah. operation. And I wanted to know whether in the traders that you uh, studied, you said um, <clears throat> some dealt with 100,000, that was the peanuts end, and some 500 million. And I wanted to know whether the perception of risk was the same in the two ends. In other words, would the trader dealing with 100,000 say, well, I'm quite prepared to make a profit or a loss of 10K, 10%. Would the trader dealing with 500 million have the same perception of risk? Would he be prepared to go up to 50 million, or was he only going to deal with 1%, 5 million. And what I'm asking is, yeah. did these traders at that end think they were dealing with real money? Because there is a conception amongst government, for example, they lose track of the noughts. Yeah. I have a daughter who worked in procurement in the side of the Ministry of Defence, and she was dealing with a budget of 500 million in her role as quite senior officer. And I, she said, I'm going to give this up. I'm disillusioned. I'm going to be a school bursar. And I said, but that's peanuts, dear. She said, no, Dad, it's real money. Yeah. It's and I want to know whether that was a perspective that these guys lose a sense that they're dealing with real money. So I'm afraid I can only give you an anecdotal answer to that, Mike, because we didn't actually try to quantify that uh, properly. But um, my impression, and certainly John's impression that got him into this in the first place, and my impression was that actually once you've been dealing with those very large digits, actually it doesn't become real. That actually your perception is changed and distorted in some way. <laughs> And that actually for the guy who's just getting up in life and just trying to make 10,000 here or there, for him that perception is still really very, very much a real thing. Um, and I think as these guys drift up to the bigger ends, some of them are still very acutely aware of what's going on, but some of them, at least anecdotally, do seem to have lost the, the noughts. They don't really want to know where the noughts are. And it's actually quite staggering to watch people, because some of these decisions are a minute. They place a position with a large amount of money and one minute later having sold, they buy. And I don't know about you, but I would be paralyzed trying to make that decision in that time frame. But I don't have any hard evidence, I'm afraid. Uh, Mark, that's a lovely work. I really enjoyed it. Um, the difference between endogenous cortisol and exogenous cortisol is, is of course, the catecholamines. Yeah, yeah. And um, harder to measure, but presumably your heart rate yeah, good would, have, would have picked up the difference between good your Good point, answer. Jerry. Yeah, really good point. So we did that. So we did, the, uh, we did a whole variety of measures of sympathetic and parasympathetic tone just to do that, and we did not see any discernible change between them in the two arms. But yeah, thank you for raising that. That was the only way we felt we could tackle that. Yeah. Terrific talk, really. Thank you. Um, I think I heard a long time ago as a lay wisdom that a no number of car accidents are because we really, really, really like to uh, just speed up, but we actually don't really sub sub uh, subjectively love to slow down. Is that related? Um, it's a nice idea. Could be. I don't, certainly don't have any evidence to support it, but it's a nice idea. Might be. And I think last question now. I'm struck with the difference in the two, two um, studies where you look at the testosterone and it's missing. Do you think there may be a pheromonal effect? Because I'm, I'm struck by the fact you have a group of men sitting there doing all the same thing, and, and the markets are led, so there's yeah. the whole world does the same thing. Yeah. Do you think that there's, there may be, as a pherom in that trading floor, there may be a pheromonal effect, which maybe you didn't pick up in the study? Because if you're in the study individuals, you're not going to get that. Yeah, it's a very good question again. And again, it's something we thought about, and of course, we just couldn't answer that question at the end of the day, but I think it's a, it's a very good question. Again, one of the problems with this is that you look at individual hormones in isolation, but we all know that so much is moving, and you're trying to control for as many of those variables as you can and questionnaires to what other things are going on. I think all of these are possibilities, and distilling this the way I've done is obviously simplifying it. Just one other thing. Did did you have you looked at testosterone to cortisol ratios as, as a 
marker of yeah. whether they can overcome the stress and keep their testosterone up, but those are the better risk takers. So, if, so at the moment we're actually doing that, and we're doing that with a couple of other markers as well to see whether we can actually detect something. Because it would be re so essentially the question that comes back to us from the trading floor is, can you now tell us who we should retain in the job? And I think this also is likely to get me in front of the GMC. So I think the answer is no, I can't. <laughs> Mark, thank you very, very much.